Hey everybody, welcome to the Age of Quarantine. I'm David Castillo, your host tonight, also one of the owners and head talent buyer over at St. Vitus. We got the incomparable, incomparable um, Steve Von Till from Neurosis tonight. He's absolutely brilliant, uh, true luminary in our scene, and really happy to talk to him. Uh, if you guys haven't, whoa, sorry about that. <laughs> Let's see if we can fix this up. Whoop, sorry. Um, if you haven't checked out, we posted an awesome, awesome, awesome uh, clip from We Are The Pit today um, that highlights some different issues with the race within our community and uh it's with ethan from primitive man the author lana dawes and jason allen from fever 333 definitely check that out if you guys haven't and uh keep informing yourselves on everything going on today uh steve should be with us shortly also thanks to everybody who's been just you know helping us out buying merch donating all that good stuff oh here's steve right now And you should be at the moment. Happy Friday, everybody. Hmm. Let's see. I'm trying to get Steve on. I'm having some issues, having some issues, connecting. There he is. Oh, hey. How's it going, man? Pretty good. How about yourself? Man, I'm hanging in there, you know? Another Friday, we're here, quarantined up, and uh, happy to be talking to yourself, man. Um, just a, a real honor and uh, always, always a pleasure. Um, I usually start the interviews the same way, so I'm going to ask you. If you were not at home, do you know where you'd be right now? Probably still be at home right now. I would have... Uh if everything had gone along as planned school year would have just ended. So I would have just finished work and would have been getting ready for some shows next month. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. I see. So the world's most badass fourth grade teacher here with us <laughs> live today. Um, my wife's an educator, so she definitely oh, right on. appreciated that she's DOE now. So she's a 12 month employee. So, Oh, I yeah, um, she made that transition a little while ago, but um, a real pleasure. So, you know, with, with these, we just kind of take it from the top, you know, we kind of start deep in and we'll, we'll get to the present day. Um, so one of the questions I usually ask is I always think that it goes back to when you're really young. Um, what were the kind of some really early memories of being attracted to music when you were like a kid? My parents both were into music. They uh, always had a good, you know, 70s hi-fi. And uh, my dad listened to a lot of, like, Kingston Trio, John Denver, Jim Croce uh, stuff. And my mom listened to a little bit more of uh, what we would now call classic rock, you know, 70s rock, Eagles, uh, Queen, Journey, stuff like that. And I was, I was always into putting on the headphones and tripping out on the stereo panning or the uh the way things sounded I, I i was always drawn to it and then like a lot of of a lot of us probably similar stories i just always wanted it heavier and harder wherever i could find it at whatever age i could find stuff sure so it kind of just started with that that young love when did you in your kind of quest to get heavier and harder what what was like the times that you kind of I guess as you grew older, it started to discover more like punk and hardcore and the things that would go on to kind of shape more your musical path. Yeah, it, um, you know, again, I kind of probably went through a lot of the same thresholds of, of guys my age where it was whatever we could get on the radio, you know, and, and uh, luckily 70s rock radio was pretty good. There was lots of uh, Hendrix and Deep Purple and ACDC and uh Ted Nugent. And of course, you know, when you're seven, eight years old and you go to the department store with your folks and you find those cutout LPs where they used to cut the corner uh. the jack jackets and sell them for like a buck, a buck 99. Uh, Kiss. You saw those Kiss album covers and, and, you know, it was over. 
And uh, I was just kind of having this conversation with somebody about an hour ago where the, the different hurdles were kind of, uh, okay, kiss, you know, they look, they look cool. This is like totally into like cartoons or uh, whatever young boys are into. But, and my mom actually took me to a kiss concert in 1979. I saw a commercial on TV and I was like, I, we've got to go, you know, at the cow palace in San Francisco. And so a couple other moms and other boys in our neighborhood, we were kind of a, a gang in our neighborhood there, little, uh, bike riding, kiss, listening to troublemakers. And we all went and saw kiss and it was, it was, uh, it was incredible. A couple of years later, she took me to the stones at the cow palace um, which I grew to appreciate quite a bit later on, you know, as I was uh, trying first getting into heavy metal, you know, stones weren't too cool. It took, took time to come around to the oldies, you know? And then, yeah, of course. I think it's kind of that common process where like that first music you listen to, you kind of like, you're like, I'm not that anymore. I abandoned it. You know, like I'm not my mom's <laughs> shit, dad shit. Right. Um, yeah. For me, it was a bit different. It was Latin music really. Um, oh, you know, cool. Like, my parents aren't, you know, uh, from this country. So um, as far as kind of getting into into punk after you kind of got into that big 70s kind of like, you know, rock radio sound, what what did what led you in, into punk or like kind of the moments that kind of get you in there? So it was really be when I got into high school. I mean, I, there were some like seeds. Um, I remember visiting a, a childhood friend as we were kind of older and had gone apart and he had a copy of X Los Angeles. Um, and we sat and listened to that. And I, I hadn't really been exposed to that, that style before that kind of like rockabilly influence, you know, the guitars aren't super heavy. Uh, but it really kind of caught my, caught my attention. And there was, there was also that those early years of MTV when they played what, whatever content they could find. Cause there wasn't a lot of video content back then. No. Um, I think there there was some interesting stuff thrown in once in a while, you know, like uh, Paul Diano era, Iron Maiden, um, uh, this band Kraut, uh, kind of a, a punk band for that time. The, uh, the the fucking Kraut, so fucking good, man. Yeah, I mean, and so that, uh, and I think even Suicidal Tendencies had a, a video early on. Absolutely, yeah, um, they, they were they were definitely one of the first that were on MTV and like making the, those sorts of rounds, you know? For sure. And so th those are the seeds planted. And also I, there was a, a show we had on Friday nights called um, Night Flight. And they, uh, I think that planted a lot of different seeds. They would show Dead Kennedys clips. They would show uh, this new wave theater, kind of public, public television, uh, public access channel punk show from LA with lots of interesting bands. Uh, they would also show weird messed up art films like uh, Brazil or um, uh, um, David Lynch's early stuff. And so all that stuff was kind of starting to warp the brain, but getting into high school with, um, I was uh, 13, 14, that's 1983. So the thrash, scene in the Bay Area was just starting to happen. And I wasn't old enough to get into those clubs. I was like a couple years too shy of having a driver's license. To so in, in your San Francisco too. So that was probably like the Ruthie's in that kind of era Testament. Right. Yeah. Let's, bonded right. By blood. Exactly. Like, a, yeah, the, um, so by the time we, uh, I had friends old enough to drive. Yeah. We went to the bonded by blood record release party at the Kabuki the ride, the lightning record release part, uh, shows. Um, I was too young to get to some of those classic Ruthie's shows by like a year, you know, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I was, I was two years, I was at 83. I was, uh, zero to one. So don't, don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, but all those things started meshing and there was, there was only a few of us in my high school that were into extreme music. You know, everybody else was into Led Zeppelin and Pink Floyd or whatever. And the uh, you know, old school 70s stoners in the corner in the smoking section, you know, and, and uh, <laughs> we were, uh, 
we were cross pollinating, you know, we were like somebody would bring in uh, the germs or, or dead Kennedys or discharge and, and we'd be bringing in venom and, uh, and we'd start going, Oh wait, venom and discharge. There's a lot of similarity there. And when you first put the needle down, you know, on those huge wall of guitars. Yeah, I mean, it's one of those things, too, I think that people have to remember at that time, too. It wasn't like this straight line of, like, I can search things and by genre and drill, 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 drill. It was very what you had access to and how those things were kind of coming to you. Sometimes it was artwork. Sometimes it was I follow a label. And you get really surprised, right? It was like a, a really a diaspora of people that you were yeah. sort of following. Absolutely. And then we started, you know, discovering the underground punk scene and that there were shows, you know, in, in uh, movie theaters or warehouses and people, you know, were going to see uh, social unrest and verbal abuse and uh, lots of great bands were playing all over the Bay Area. We down in San Jose, where I was from, we'd go to San Francisco, we'd go to Berkeley and Oakland. Uh, and then by the time we got to the end of high school, the Gilman Street uh, scene had kind of started there in uh, in the East Bay, and, and we could we could know for sure we could go to two shows a, two shows a weekend. Yeah, you know? they were cheap, and and you get all those fun Green Day Neurosis flyers out there. <laughs> <I mean. laughs> who would have ever who would have ever thought that uh, where, where all those things would end up? But uh, yeah, absolutely. So with the Gilman Street uh, sort of scene, when did you really start? playing music when did you want to become like an active participant uh, my dad got me a guitar when i was nine i got my first electric guitar uh he was in a band in high school kind of a more kingston trio you know harmony um early kind of folk stuff um it didn't really resonate with me yet i mean i wanted it i knew i wanted it uh but i didn't have any discipline to sit and play it a lot. And, uh, I want, and I wanted a different shape guitar. It was, it was a beautiful old Mose Wright hollow body with the F holes and which I really wish I never got rid of. But at the time I was like, Oh yeah. Like no. for, for your solo stuff today, you're like, Hey, maybe I, I didn't yeah. want that. <laughs> maybe I shouldn't have traded that in for some stupid pointy guitar. But, uh, um, so I, when I got into high school, I met a guy in, in one of my classes who, was a couple years older than me, and he's like, ah, you play guitar, I play guitar. Why don't you be my rhythm guitarist, you know? And uh, so I just had to learn. He, you know, he showed me a bar chord, and that bar chord was all I needed. He was one of those guys who wanted to play in Van Halen and Randy Rhodes and Michael Schenker. In fact, it was big time Michael Schenker. We did lots of UFO and Michael Schenker songs and early Scorpions. And so I was just figuring out enough to hold down rhythm guitar stuff. And it was still uh, amazing to me, all these guys that figured out those fretboard gymnastics of how to do all those solos. And and I never did figure that out. And so I was... Yeah, you listen really, to like Love at First Thing or like what and you're just like, <laughs> like, this is incredible. And Randy, of course, you know? It, yeah. So again, I didn't have any discipline with practicing like the instrument as a as that type of musician, but thank God for punk rock because punk rock showed me it didn't matter. That did what matters is, do you feel something? Are you passionate about something? You got one good note, then play it as hard as you can and, and, you know, screw it. The rest, the rest will fall into place. And, you know, most of those folks that were the fretboard gymnasts of the day, they probably don't make music anymore. Mm. It you feels know. like sometimes those folks were after a technical pursuit. It was like almost like a, like as far as opposed to like, hey, I'm conveying uh, my emotion to you, and 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 like there's a human, the human kind of element of conveying that to you, and that's really uh, kind of what, what the direct capacity of music, right? They're like, yeah. no, I want to be able to do all of this, and that's right. kind of a very different pursuit, I think. Yeah, and it, it's a valid pursuit. It's just not, that's not, it's not my gift. I don't have that type of discipline to sit and work on something over and over again. But, but what I did have discipline for was eventually like trying to write my own songs. You know, like, oh, well, 
you know, I'm, I'm watching all these bands playing pretty simple stuff and, you know, they mean it. And I just started writing my own songs. I, I started a band with some guys from school and we were doing some fairly primitive kind of crossover thrashy stuff. And we just started making it up, you know, and, and then uh, was lucky enough to have a, a teacher in high school who um, was into home recording and oh. uh, had a reel to reel four track. And he's, and uh, now that's talking, something special, especially at that time, like big time. Yeah. Like, you know, and now I feel like recording is such a ubiquitous thing, but that's not, that, that wasn't the case. No, no. And so that planted that whole seed, which I've followed my home whole life of having a, having a home recording setup, you know, and, and uh, back then it was more difficult with the tape based stuff and the lack of uh, affordable uh, consumer level stuff you could, you could get, but but so we started messing around with that and we found out you could how to go record and how to dub in our cassettes and uh, walk in all of our cassettes to every skate shop and head shop and record store. And, you know, Hey, can we sell our demo here? You know, mm -hmm. and, and uh, the, the, the difference in distribution, right? <laughs> here, I got stuff. Sell it. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was, but I'm so thankful for that time because that planted all the seeds to all the way to today where you, um, we are forced to do it yourself and take it upon yourself to, uh, for whatever reason, you feel your art is valid and worth being in the world and, and you throw it out there, you know, and, and uh, you know, you, you get past all that self-doubt of is this good enough? Is this worthy enough? Um who am I to think I can put something out in the, out in the world worthwhile. And, and uh, you know, that's something that I've been following this whole time, you know, to run in our record label out of the barn over there, you know? Yeah. I think that that's something that I think is very important is that the more conversations that I have that are, you know, like this is, you know, despite the maybe disparate amount of styles, I mean, we've interviewed a ton of people across the board is that the ethos has permeated through all of it, you know what I mean? Um, genre and style is like taking those lessons and, and moving them forward, which obviously um, still holds true today with Nora and everything that you guys have done. So you've been, you were playing and then, you know, when did you kind of start forming the relationship with Neurosis and then eventually getting into the band? Yeah, I, I, uh, I became friends with Dave Ed uh, you know, it was a hour drive from San Jose up to Berkeley to go to see all the shows all the time. So, uh, he and I became really good friends. He let me crash on his couch and, you know, we just, uh, go to shows and hang out all weekend and talking a lot about music. He, he was, he gave me a big education on music. I didn't know. And, you know, we shared a lot about, uh, what we were listening to and, um, I also had a fanzine for a while. I put out a few issues of a fanzine and neurosis was one of the bands. I, I interviewed one of the local bands. You know, I, I would go to go to shows at the farm and interview, you know, all, all the bands that were playing every band I could find. I would interview them. I, I interviewed COC and uh, Voivod and a lot of the local punk guys. And, uh, uh, neurosis was one that uh, we went to their practice space, me and a couple of friends and interviewed them. And um, so over time, yeah, they were getting rid of their, they were definitely them and Christ on parade, which Noah from neurosis, his first band. Uh, uh, um, they were my two favorite local bands for sure. Neurosis and Christ on parade. And uh so that that kind of sound was my wheelhouse, you know, Amoebics, Rudimentary, Peni, Subhumans, uh, Battalion of Saints, Black Flag, Joy Division. Like, those were all the sounds I really resonated with. To Kreutzen, even Voivod can be thrown in there for those weird dissonant chords. Yeah, love it. And uh, so we kind of formed a bond. And then when they got rid of their first guitarist, Chad, uh, initially they had, a another second guitarist and that didn't work out. And, uh, they asked if I wanted to join neurosis and oh, I, I didn't even have to let them finish the sentence, you know, like, absolutely. 
And uh, the stuff I was writing in my own band, um, which was the same guys from my first thrash band, we, Tribe of Resistance was what we were called at the time, uh, 100% political band, uh, kind of a the peace punk lyrical content with with some of these kind of weird dissonant things that we would explore together uh, i was bringing what i was toying with into some of what uh i joined right before word as law was recorded so most of it was written um but uh there was a little space for me to still put my input in my guitar parts and I brought one song to the table, To What End, which was kind of bringing in some of that guitar stuff I was experimenting with. And and um, it was incredible to play with guys that, you know, I mean, we were young, we were super naive, we weren't very good at our instruments. Um, <laughs> figuring it out, we had the idea of what we wanted to sound like. We just had no idea how to get there. I like, think that that's very important um, to, to kind of highlight too, because it doesn't, first of all, it takes time. Like one of the things I'd like to tell people too, is it takes time to, you know, everyone talks about neurosis, genre breaking, you know, yada, yada. And it's like, it takes time. It takes experimentation and it takes, uh, like a willingness. And it's not always about necessarily having the proficiency, right. To do the thing that's up here, but to arrive at that idea of what's up here with your proficiency it's, it usually doesn't go the other way around i think yeah and, and i don't know if we actually ever got more proficient uh <laughs> <laughs> oh steve stop we i mean we did we learned a few things we what we learned to do is work with our limitations and we learned to use limitations to our advantage you know that we were never going to have these kind of chops that some genres kind of require you know um we took a lot of inspiration more from those bands I mentioned earlier, the Black Flag, Joy Division, uh, uh, Rudimentary Peanut, bands that sound like they came out of nowhere. Like you don't know, you don't know what the reference points are, you know? And um, so we just wanted to do something completely original that was from the, from the heart that was, that was the sound of, of everything that goes on in being human. You know, the existential questions of what, why are we here? What, what's our purpose here? What's our connection to the earth? What's our connection to each other? What's our connection to ourselves or to our own minds? What are the struggles all of us deal with internally? Um, the struggles we deal with as, as small communities, large communities, entire societies. Like, what is the emotional content behind all of it? Yeah, that's something that I thought I, I've I've heard you speak on it before, and it was something kind of to the same effect that you were talking about, like you know, just wanting to be able to sonically capture the breadth of like human emotion of of of, of a lot of different shades. And I feel like as neurosis has gone on, it has unpacked a, a lot of that as maybe that proficiency has grown, or maybe even just the discovery of. Of, of what you've been able to do. And I think you can kind of sort of see it, you know, as you go from like times of grace and, 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 and on further. And I feel like it just, it just kind of blooms. And that's something that, you know, you said, and that I think that you guys have continued to be able to capture. What was the, the, the impetus? Was it just like, Hey, I just, at a certain point, I don't want to be this super dense monolithic thing. I want to, give more room like what was that moment because i feel like a, a band like yours after times of grace and certain things like that you could have stuck with that for a while well i think in the uh you know when we first ex when we first kind of really found our sound after word as law we got to souls at zero and, and we started hearing what do we need to be able to sound like what you ex the breadth of human experience sonically um in hindsight, now I can, I can see the path a little more clearly. But, um, for example, things like Public Enemy, where they had things like very primitive samplers that they were using, but they sounded like frickin' riots in the streets. They sounded like uh, all of a sudden air raid sirens become instruments, you know? And uh, so the fact that you had this thing that you could take and manipulate any sound that exists into an instrument 
aside from the fact that we could also use keyboards, you know, to, to get our, uh, uh, you know, big distorted organs and string sounds on and synthesizers, but, but to be able to take any sound in the world and manipulate it into an instrument seemed like a really important step. And there weren't a whole lot of folks doing that. I think, uh, Coil was using Fairlight synthesizers a little bit uh, before that. Um, some of the early industrial bands were doing that. But that kind of gave us that ability to really have those um, those layers of, of emotion, layers of sound. And, you know, we took it the next step further in Enemy of the Sun, where we kind of really discovered that unbridled, uh, reckless abandon level of aggression uh combined with this more psychedelic nature of what we wanted to do um you know well, what's it what's it sound like when you're losing it in the woods <laughs> by, by yourself sure uh, and then through silver and blood is where it was just no holes barred it was um we've never really taken the audience into consideration when creating but the few times where we might have like had discussions of, uh, of how it might be perceived was probably around that time. And it was probably evil laughter. Of, <laughs> like, Oh, that's not nice. We, but you know, that's really not very nice sounding. We better do that 32 times. Oh, was, I love it, that. You know, instead of four 32. times. It, yeah, yeah. It was like, it was just like, you know, uh, uh, whoever's listening to this is, is the enemy and we should just destroy everything in our path. And, and, um, finding that space really was a result of touring that material, touring the through silver and blood material for years and giving that much of ourselves physically, because we also made a commitment to physically embody the sound. It's not enough to just stand there and deliver that stuff. You have to let it flow through you. Mm. And and those sounds weren't nice, and those energies weren't always very nice. And letting that letting that stuff rip through you on an emotional level um, is exhausting. And sure. uh, takes I mean, a it, toll. Is, it is a monolithic, huge slab, and like you guys really, I think, uh, created that. Uh, or like, or at least were instrumental in creating those kind of levels. You guys, swans, etc of of that sort of thing and and it's just a, a really um layered and like beautiful approach but i think it's really amazing to me that you talk about like the sampler and the synthesizer and the different things like that than the uh new possibilities that it opens right because everything from hip-hop to like sbk and throbbing gristle right public enemy to that and it's like this is a new instrument a new innovation in technology and look at the different ways that different people have used it to kind of amplify themselves and what they have inside, right? Yeah. Public Enemy amplified it in this very um, incredible way. I mean, the Bomb Squad, which cool. should be really, you know, highlighted here. For um, sure. With Ice Cube and America's Most Wanted, maybe being their best record. But also, then you have everything from, you know, SBK and Throbbing Gristle and stuff like that. And just opening those po possibilities. But I feel like one of the things that you've talked about before that I think is really interesting is that you guys always want to inhabit like an elemental place, which I really feel that neurosis feels so organic, but you use so many electronics. How do you kind of marry those two things? Good question. Um, um, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's all about intent. Yeah. You know, I mean, a, a tool is a tool and it's the, it's the intent and the thought and the energy put behind how you use it. Uh, it provides the end result, whether it's a, a, you know, you can use a chainsaw to just take down some trees back here in the property and cut some firewood, or you can use it to make a beautiful work of art. You know, it's just, it depends on that. Uh, um, way that you the way that you want it to manifest and so really for us it was using the, the sounds of the natural world made the most sense and plus uh philosophically lyrically spiritually we we um the connection of the human 
soul to nature and uh, to our place within it. Um, not to mention simply using the metaphors of nature to describe human emotion is hugely important. I mean, you, you don't get any uh, um, uh, more distant than space. You don't get any deeper than the ocean. You don't get any uh, uh, higher than the mountaintop, right? So, I mean, all of that stuff is going to be the natural way to uh, express the depth of human emotion and even your personal relationship and events behind maybe what you're writing about, but to cloak it in metaphor so that rather than, you know, you having to be bored with having a voyeuristic experience of my pathetic trials and tribulations, you know, you can have your own original emotional experience where you've applied your own life and experience to the sound that you're hearing, to the emotional backdrop. Sure. And I mean, that that's a kind of amazing thing, too, because I feel Neurosis as a music over time has given you so much space. And that also gives you like a moment to inhabit it for yourself. And I think that that's like one of the most special qualities of it. It's like I'm finding myself in these moments and I'm just I'm with myself. I mean, it might be loud as fuck, but I'm with myself. And I think that that's one of the most beautiful parts uh, about the band in, in general. Um, so as, as you, you know, kind of are, are, are doing this really, I mean, forward thinking, experimental, fucked up shit, you know, um, it starts to catch on at, at, a, at a certain moment. And uh, what were, what was like a moment where you were like, man, I'm just kind of following my nose here, but I think that, this is starting to kind of go somewhere, kind of getting a little bit more popular, et cetera, et cetera. What was a moment like that where you felt maybe like, uh, wow, like uh, I'm, I'm, I'm around some, th this is something new. Hmm. Hard to say. Like in, in some ways there was always little, little bits of where you find your people, you know, and you like in the early days, like in the early nineties, you know, like, um, touring with people like I Hate God and Buzz Oven and Unsane, you know, just finding kindred spirits who don't sound the same necessarily, but uh, you, you just have some common bond of wanting to make heavy, heavy messed up music that's pushing the envelope, you know? So, so there was always those kind of few bands that found each other because coming up out of punk rock, as soon as we got the keyboards and the samples and our guitars got heavier, you know, some of the hardcore purists, even maximum rock and roll, they wouldn't let they wouldn't let us advertise in the magazine anymore because Tim Johannan said, "Oh, those are guys who are like progressive rock now." They're like, "Yes." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, that's good. And and, uh, and really, yeah. No, I mean, we were thinking more fucking thro like you said, throbbing gristle, or just you know, some way to sound freaking intense and. Um, so it's little by little finding people because we always felt like the black sheep from that point. I mean, we were on lookout records and that we loved the support of that label and, and Larry and, and uh, all the, a lot of those bands were our friends mm -hmm. and our, and our peers, but obviously artistically we didn't fit in there. Um, we went to alternative tentacles. We felt more at home cause they were so uh, diverse you know, they had everything from Amoebics and part-time Christians, uh, Zenegeva, um, to Vagtazo Halukemic, uh from Hungary, uh, and Alice Donut. I mean, so many strange, interesting bands um, that like, it felt like, okay, so there's some other people that are into like heavy sounds, different sounds. With and uh, just kind of pushing everything forward in their own corners, I feel like, right? Right, yeah, absolutely. Like, you know, connections to the kind of underground art scene, warehouse scene, industrial scene, what have you. There's lots of different t um, feelers out there to find a few different freaks looking for something heavy and different. And then move, when we moved on to relapse, it was interesting because we really didn't feel uh, – that we were a metal band. Um, you know, we love, we are fans of heavy metal, obviously. And I mean, I'm a metal head at heart my, my whole life. I mean, you can't get motorhead out of my veins. It's just in there. Um, I mean, you heard the stories already. We know. 
So, uh, but uh, it was interesting because they, they were looking to broaden their perspective and, uh, and do different stuff. Like they were putting out a lot of Japanese noise through their release uh, side label and, and other things. And so we're like, okay, heavy metal now is turning out to be more open-minded than punk rock because you got these metal heads all of a sudden listening to Mertzbo and Masana and, uh, and industrial music and noise music. And it was starting to really cross pollinate in a different way. And in Europe, we found a lot of connections with people looking for something more artsy, you know, and more, more connected with, um, different genres. And, and so really it's just been slowly finding those few freaks in the corner. It, I never felt like there was a moment, you know, we toured with on Ozfest and with Pantera and, and that was always kind of about feeling like we were in um, foreign territory, but reaching those few people that didn't didn't know they were looking for something, but they found it. Yeah, and I think that that's a great thing. It's kind of uh, the way that I see it, at least too. At least my impression from the outside looking in is that that's the really the way that it was. That Neurosis didn't turn into a band that plays to you know fifteen hundred people. It was like this just nice incremental slow burn up and up and up and, and people slowly started coming to you and you guys as a band were willing to also play. You know, there there, there wasn't, um, you know, the comfortability of having like these sort of like sub-genre scenes or I'm going to play with these people, these people, these people. I'm like, I play with Green Day and Pantera and Isis and, and, and we're, we're going to grab exactly all of that and all of a sudden when Neurosis plays, now a thousand people are coming, so on and so forth, right? What was it like when you were, you, you headlined a show and you really kind of felt that though, and you were like, wow, we, over the years, we've really grabbed a lot of, <laughs> a lot of the freaks in the corner and now the freaks front and center. It was probably like in the, probably wasn't until the late nineties after we had uh, stopped touring for the most part. You know, because, I mean, the biggest place we would have headlined uh, before that might have been 500, 750 people, if we were lucky, you know, um, and only in a few key cities here and there. Yeah. Uh, um, and so it was really kind of, we didn't disappear. We just changed gears. You know, we, instead of being like full-time touring warriors, we realized it was not sustainable for us. Um, that we had to kind of pull back and, and find sort of balanced lives where we could support ourselves and our families and be better husbands and fathers uh, and not do any weird shit to compromise our art, you know? Because you st when you look at those like mid-level, mid to lower level uh, metal bands on those big circuits, and the, the things that they feel they need to do <laughs> to make it, it's, uh, it seemed pretty gross, you know? It can be sort of embarrassing sometimes. You feel the pa pandering. And yeah. It's something that, um, you know, it leads me right into my next question, which is basically the fact that you guys, uh, and, and especially you, said, you know, I, I never wanted to turn this into something that was overtly fis fiscal and, like, less spiritual for myself. And so you, I feel like this is the moment where you made that choice or you're like, Hey, I, I want to do those things. Um, was that a difficult thing to do? Or was it just like, Hey, you know what, this is a perfect time to just kind of retreat into the artistry and continue to make neurosis better and better and, you know, invest in other parts of life. Yeah. I mean, it, it was multi-leveled. It was, um, it was uh, people's conflict with the home life. It was, uh, financially, it, it's, it, I mean, it sounds good to say we didn't want it to become something fiscal, but if we could have made zero compromises at all and, and um, you know, we're able to play just a reasonable amount of shows per year and uh, make, a, make a living for five families, uh, nobody would have argued about it, but but the reality was that in practicality, we really saw that you were borrowing from this place to play th to pay this place, and everything is kind of digging a hole. Uh, 
in different angles and that um, uh, we had a revelation that the debt economy is not sustainable. And so we don't want to be beholden to anybody. And as I think we all see in this moment right now, how fragile our decadent um, system we set up is, you know, I mean, uh, how um, we couldn't have perceived a pandemic or something like that. But, but even at the time, I think we were thinking we're only one broken arm away from five families going hungry. Damn. You know? And so, because it's like, you know, you make just enough to survive each that month. And, um, my dogs might have spotted some wildlife. They might start barking. Um, it's all good, man. I love dogs. It's fine. Um, Mine is on the porch with my wife right now, so it's tight. <laughs> awesome. Uh, and so, um, really, it was kind of a practical decision. Like, we need to get back. We need to get back to ground zero, where we don't owe anybody anything, and we need a balanced life where we don't feel like we would make any artistic compromises uh, under that weird mindset that we saw other folks doing um, to try to earn a living from it. And so, you know, if you can strike a balance where your life has, uh, I think even Steve Albini said something that stuck in my head once, like, I don't, I don't buy into it entirely, but he said he views uh, shellac and his time with it and his music making with them as a treasured hobby. Mm. You know, and I, I would never use the word hobby with neurosis because it's more of a life. Um, but it had to change so that we wouldn't have any weird shit come up and tear it apart from the inside because of, of financial problems or. I think that that's a really good point, too, because, you know, it's it's a it's a big unit as far as all the people involved, too. And if you put too much pressure on it, too much stress on the system, it can break from the inside very easily. And this happens to bands all the time. And Steve has written a couple of essays, even about the kind of the scourges of the industry and the, and the way that that can, can really work. So I think maybe for you guys, a couple steps back have allowed you to expand and, and continue to grow and, and be the band that, that you are, um, which is, I think, to me, like a, a really wise move. And also, um, I think that uh, people expect maybe artists to be artists all the time and they're humans that have like full, fully formed lives. So I think that that's something that that's great to communicate to people, uh, especially now and stuff, you know, um, to, to kind of show all those different things. So as you kind of, in, 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 in a certain way, you kind of continue to get bigger during that time sometimes pulling back is a great thing right because yeah it was uh, it was ironic like when we came back and started playing shows after uh i mean we had or it did allow us to do things like organize a couple of festivals we did the beyond the pale festival a couple of years in a row um what we learned is we did not like organizing festivals uh, <laughs> i love i love the ass dude take it from me uh, yeah yeah i it was all the time i bet man i mean i loved the pick in the bands part i didn't like all the behind the scenes business part um and uh but um stepping away also gave an appreciation i think not uh, for the fans and us like for myself the way i've tried to view it and it becomes more and more clear all the time i have an immense sense of gratitude that anybody cares about our strange self-expression. I mean, the fact that anybody likes our weird music is, is miraculous. Um, and the fact that we built it up to a level or it became a level on its own where we could uh, tour in relative uh, uh, comfort and ease compared to our early days and play you know, big cities uh, in, a, in all over the U.S. and Europe and Japan and Australia. And news, um, whenever is whenever it's whenever it works, is uh, nothing to take for granted. You know, I don't feel that we are owed it. I don't feel we deserve it. I feel like we're lucky to have had those experiences and. Uh, so really it's just gratitude that making music 
making original music, making heartfelt music that um, helps us deal with uh, living, you know, all the complexity. It's our way of purging. It's our way of surviving stuff. And, and so really to have kind of taken that step back and come back to it has really given us a sense of gratitude. And I think also um, – the audience is more appreciative. They know we're not coming every six months or year like it was for a while. There's no guarantee that we're going to be uh, in Indianapolis uh, again in another six months, you know. Uh, people might have to travel somewhere to see us if they want to see us on a given year, um, uh, which makes sense because we have to travel there too. And so it becomes more of an event, <laughs> you know. We, we all, we all got to go somewhere together to – to make something of value happen. And um, I don't know. I, I'm just grateful for all the experiences. Yeah, absolutely, man. And um, it, it's, it's, it's kind of, um, it, it, it shows the um, kind of existential nature of the music and, you know, you, you guys having to make those different choices to kind of keep weaving your path, you know, through all this. One of the things that you said about the debt economy got me thinking as well about the fact that you guys have been on your own label for quite some time. And obviously I feel like that definitely harkens back to the, you know, kind of crass records or, you know, all, all the, the different punk leans that you had. When did you decide to establish that? And um, in the pandemic, by the way, they've been doing pay what you want for all the records, which is I think a really beautiful and amazing thing. So if you could speak on Neurot, just, touch it for a minute and let me let us know why you established that yeah it, we started neurot recordings in 1999 um uh, i had always wanted us to have a record label I, I was in the right before i joined neurosis i was in the um, beginnings of wanting to start one um i'd pressed up some seven inches on my first band and and then um once I joined Neurosis, it's like, oh, shit, well, we're on lookout. And then I'll, you know, there was no reason to do it then. It was like being on all these great record labels with great people and, and people that have inspired me. And um, it, it, I think about in the late 90s, we just realized that um, we kind of wanted to bring it all home. Even though we enjoyed the people we were working with, uh, still friends with Matt from Relapse to this day and the other guys working there. Um, but it, it just seemed to make sense that in the long, the long view, you want to buy the craft from the craftsman. You want to, you know, go to the farm to table produce grower. You want to go to the, uh, furniture maker. You want, you know, so why not get the music straight from the source? And that, and that was our history and DIY stuff. Um, so our first thought was, now I think uh, my new record is Neurot number 116. Wow. So, um, so we have put out bands from all over the world. We put out bands that are unsung heroes of mine, <laughs> you know, that still don't get a, a much appreciation and um, put out a lot of great, interesting music. And, um, you know, when the... Uh, pandemic came through that whole pay what you want thing i we actually totally stole that idea lovingly uh from temporary residents um cool they're in brooklyn i believe um they uh they had first put that out there and and i just thought that's too good of an idea not to not to do as well you know like so, a lot of our friends and peers i mean forget the people in bands if, if you're in a band and you don't realize you're uh lifestyle and your um uh income stream is extremely risky you know you got you got another thing coming but i mean what about the bartenders the bar owners the uh booking agents the people whose entire who are, aren't getting artistic gratification out of the infrastructure of of independent music the people that are doing it uh on the day-to-day -to, -day to keep it moving you know Sure. And to, to provide the venues for bands to play and, and all those things. So with so many people out of work or not being able to go to work or not, not having their income stream, it just makes sense to like, Hey, here's a record. If you can pay for it, cool. That'll support the band. If you can't it, just enjoy it and have it help you get through uh, interesting times. 
you know? Yeah, I, I think that's just like a, a beautiful thing and kind of um, maybe highlighting the fact of what art and music can do for you, you know, right. and, and that exchange and what we all look to it for. And yeah. uh, whether it's, you know, just that common expression that, you know, just identifying in a moment with a particular artist and the fact that you make that so readily available uh, is just a beautiful thing and, and a great gesture. And also, I think um, just something that really common with the times and, 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 and really cool. Um, one of the things that you said with Neurot. I believe today, if I would just not to interrupt, but today no. also um, along that lines too, Bandcamp has really shown itself to be a really amazing organization, first of all, with helping artists by giving all the proceeds to the artist. And today, uh, Juneteenth, they're donating all their proceeds um, to the NAACP uh, Legal Defense Fund, I believe. Yes. Uh, they, um, and, uh, you know, there's still plenty of hours left in this day. So if you, you know, you, you feel motivated, please go buy something off of Bandcamp. Easily the best ally for artists and probably causes in music today. I think that's safe to say. What do you feel like as label head of Neuron? Yeah, they've, they've shown their true colors. I mean, I have to admit, I, I had a like, ridiculous prejudice against Bandcamp when they first started just because I thought the name was stupid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it sounds like the summer camp, you send your kids to go do rock school. Sure. You know, but, uh, but they've proven themselves to be amazing for independent artists. Um, and, uh, like you said, you know, uh, especially days like today where a, a lot of our uh, our peers are doing art and music, not just to survive their the pandemic and where we were, but now, you know, we're in a huge moment of, uh, of, of civil unrest and standing up against racism. Um, and so the fact that a lot of people are choosing to donate a lot of their stuff, even if they might be having harsh times themselves, uh, to charities, uh, to fight ignorance and to fight racism and institutionalized racism. I think that's just a, an incredible show of the power of music, you know? Um, I agree. And I think that you see it really across the board. Uh, and I think that you see that a lot of people involved in music in one way or another, a, a lot of folks, they're, they're doing a lot. And there's somewhere someone's doing something, I feel like that's contributing to those uh, varying causes that are all incredibly worthy and um, a really important moment in our collective history, uh, if you're from the States and honestly, around the world. So definitely go check out Bandcamp, support your favorite artists and you're gonna support the NAACP and all this great stuff as well. So do it again, there's a lot of hours still left in this day. So. Let's do that. And speaking of new records, I only got five minutes left with you, Steve, but I listened to your new record this morning, and I think it is your best solo record ever. Um, I absolutely... Uh, it seems... You know, I, I thought I was going to hear an acoustic Steve on Till record, and it really just threw me for a loop in the best way. It's got such an emotional weight to it the all the strings to it all the beautiful sins to it and the way that you sit in the middle of it beautifully uh really provided me with like one of the more beautiful mornings of my quarantine whatever the fuck 2020 experience so um let's just talk about that when's the record coming out uh it'll be out august 7th august 7th so we're coming coming up on august 7th and uh what's the name of the record uh, no wilderness deep enough and it really feels that way man it feels like you're amongst the trees you're you, it feels like you have just taking there, there's no uh clapping thunder but there's just the space can you talk a little bit about how that came together and how randall dunn kind of pushed you to make that yeah the, the whole the whole process was largely accidental as uh as most of the best art that i've been a part of is you know like um uh, it, uh, my wife's from Germany and we were visiting her parents up in the north of Germany and her family has been on one plot of land like the exact same home site for over 500 years um, which you know being 
a child of of the westward migrations of people, uh, it's really hard for me to fathom being in one spot for that long. You know, even by quote old world standards, that's a long time to be there. You know, um, and so there's always kind of a depth and a weight there. And really, the whole beginnings of it was uh, jet lag, sleeplessness, um, sitting in her childhood bedroom in the corner. Uh, with a simple electronic setup and uh, just really feeling these simple kind of harmonically complex chords uh, come out. And I didn't think anything of it. Long story short, because we only got a small amount of time. I kind of put it aside, um, came home, messed around with it in my studio, added some synthesizers. It took shape, uh, but I didn't know what it was. It felt like um, it felt complete before I ever sang on it. I, I contacted Randall Dunn because I, I said, man, I think I, I think I accidentally made an ambient record. Um, but I'd like to go in the studio and put real piano to uh, replace my electronic piano and get a cello player to bring some breath to the Mellotron strings and uh, re French horn to replace the French horn parts that I had written uh, digitally. And he responded, well, after he listened to it, yeah, we should do that. That's a good idea. But a better idea would be if you sang on it and made it your next solo record. And uh, I totally disagreed. I did not think that was the right move. Well, um, I disagree with you. So uh, and so do I now. Yeah. Uh, uh, so I took, I took it as a challenge. And, and it, it so happened that it started at spring break um, in 2018 in Germany. Winter break here um, alone with the dogs. Uh, I set up a mic in the living room and, and every morning on that break, I would get my coffee, get my notebook and my pen, go to the microphone and improvise vocal melodies and, and transcribe lyrics that were, that were coming to me or going through old journals for words or phrases, anything that would make sense with these patterns I was improvising. By the end of that week, I called Randall and told him he was absolutely right. Um, let's book time in the studio. And finish this thing. That's amazing. So, Steve, we've got like about a minute 45 left. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank you for joining us. It's been an amazing interview. Thank you so much for always, you know, backing us, playing St. Vitus, doing all that stuff. Um, guys, his new record is absolutely beautiful. When you can get it in August, August 7th, please do. It's a, a, a really, really, really nice experience. I'm glad that Randall challenged you in that way. And it's Me too. Be great. And if you're a fan of Steve's other solo work and other things like that, it, all of his lyrics are also coming out on a book that's coming out soon from his Harvest Man stuff to some solo stuff. It's absolutely great. So, Steve, it's great to catch up with you. Thank you so much. And Thank, thank uh, you very much, man. Appreciate it. it. You know, we'll be doing this hopefully in person sometime soon, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Right yeah, on, man. Absolutely. Stay safe and be well, man. I'll talk stay to you. Stay safe, stay sane. Yeah. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.